Hi folks, welcome back. Before we uh, start in on what we we're going to do today, I want to show you something. A friend of mine in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, his name is Ed. I'll leave it at that. Excellent craftsman. I had Ed in a, I met him as a student, I don't know, a year or so ago, and does great work. He's a machinist by trade. And he emailed me on uh, a little tip that I didn't quite understand when he first explained it, but once I did, it was... Uh, we have solved the problem. So it involves this little plane called a router plane. I want to show you exactly what he suggested and I'm going to do it for you so you may want to incorporate this. First thing I need to show you or explain is oftentimes when I'm laying out a dovetail in order to get for show this in order to get these two pieces perfectly lined up what I do is I cut a little rabbit on the underside of the tailboard and that little rabbit will give you a shoulder that will register against the inside corner of the pin board. I'm going to do it so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. So that will be my pin board. So here's a tailboard. Uh, typically you do this, you see this? You do this before you cut the dovetail. You'll see why in a moment. But I set this in the bend, in the vise. See close enough where you are? Well, it's not that important, it's just a sample piece, but I put a little piece in there to prevent it from getting damaged. So put the board the tailboard in the vise, inside facing up, have the end of the board hanging just over the edge of the bench. Make sure it's sitting flat so you can tap your dogs and it'll pull it down. Now this is a skew block plane. Skew block plane is my uh, favorite one to do this with just because of a couple of things and I'll point them out as I do go through this. But this has a removable side plate. I'll show you what I mean. I never use it. It's just tucked away there in the tool cabinet. But that side plate goes on there and this operates as a block plane. When you remove the side plate, the blade is exposed and becomes a rabbiting plane. Now I set mine up so that the blade, you can see it with my finger, with, catch it with your fingernail, the blade is just sticking beyond the edge of the tool. I have it so that it is cutting parallel to the sole. So if I move this fence, which by the way is part of the tool, move that fence back and sight down the sole, I want to see an even projection of the blade all the way across. Now I've added this piece of wood on here. You only get, when you buy this tool, you only get the steel portion. But I need, I want a bit more registration before I engage the wood, and I want some registration after I leave the wood. So that's why I've added the fence. What I would typically do is set the fence so that the point of the blade is cutting right on the scribe line, lock the fence in place, and then carefully go in. Usually I'll take two or three light passes. Reason is, Sometimes the fibers will start to roll on you, so you want to take a very light cut. Take a heavy cut, you run the risk of that happening. One of the reasons why I always do this before I cut the tails is if I break off these corners, although it wouldn't matter on a half blind, but it does matter when it comes time to transferring the tails onto the pins because instead of having your knife register right here, if you've lost that corner, you're going to be, it's going to be tough to get an accurate mark. So I'll take two or three light passes. I'll really make this stand out. Okay. Now, you see that little ledge, and that little rabbit, that shoulder. When I put this over top of the pin board, it automatically registers the two pieces because of that shoulder. And it just, it's absolutely a fantastic way of lining the two pieces up. Well, all right, I wanted to do it on this, but in order to cut it, I, and because this is going to have a sliding lid, so you've got this piece that's going to be sitting down in here, the lid's going to slide over top of it, you'd see this rebate up here. Well, I could do one side, I could do this side because I could come along here and then stop right there and I'd be okay. However, in trying to do the other one, I wasn't going to be able to. So what Ed suggested was to use the router plane to do that. So I'm going to try it 
and see how it would work. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the sharpening of that. Now I just got to grab a screwdriver. I've got this a little tighter than it normally is. It's usually only needs to be thumb tight. All right, let's go over to the stones and I'll show you how to sharpen that little blade. All right. I'll use the same two stones that I use for everything else, which is the 1,000 and the 16,000. Take a second to flatten them. You know they're flat when they come back to being white. Don't forget to get the slurry out of there. Now, Shapton makes these holders. The stone, that's all you buy when you get the stone. But the holders, just a big, heavy hunk of glass encased in rubber. And what's nice about it is, when you're sharpening this particular blade, your hands need to be... Your hands need to be, or you, you need to be down below the stone. Actually, I'm going to start over on this one. So, now, what I've gone in is I've polished up the back. So, if you hadn't done that, and this is brand new, come in, set that down. I'm going to pretend that this is my f core stone, because I've already done this. I don't want to reintroduce scratches. But you would set that down, and just carefully hold it flat, forward and back, Covering the stone, a little bit of dish soap would lubricate that a little better. Go through, get rid of all the machining marks on the 1,000 grit. Then you're going to need an in-between grit, and I knew, typically would use a 6,000. And then I would finish with the 16,000. So once you've done the back, you don't ever have to do that again. Now to sharpen the bevel, we do the same secondary and tertiary. Come over here, register off of the primary, raise up just a few degrees, just try to hold that angle consistent, forward and back, until you can detect a slight burr. Then come over to your 16,000, come up just a little bit higher. You're putting on a tertiary bevel, and then flip it over in just a second or two to get rid of the burr. Okay, very, very small bevel in there, it only takes a second. And this, you don't cut any great amount of wood at any point when you're using this tool, so you might get away with sharpening it once a year. Okay, so when this goes back in, fits up into that, now I'm just going to just get it above. Actually, you know what, I got quite a ding on there. I just noticed that. I wonder if that's going to hamper this a little closer. Oh yeah, there is. I can catch my fingernail on it. I don't know that you can see that well enough with the camera, but there's a little ding about uh, 30 second of an inch in from the end. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, okay, well i got to get rid of that. I thought I felt something scratching the stone when I was doing that. Alright, I'll come back to the 1000 grit. I've got to get down below that neck And depending on how deep it is, this may take the better part of a minute. The only problem when you're doing these little wee narrow tools, whether it's a small chisel or something like this, is trying to keep it flat on the stone and not uh, introduce an angle. That's why these little short strokes seem to work easier. I'm applying the downward pressure with the index finger on my left hand. Because this is a bevel up, the angle is not that critical. Now, take a closer look and see if I get rid of that. You can see better with your camera than I can with my eyes. Do you see anything? Is that nick still there? Yeah, it is. I can still catch it with my finger now. Yeah. All right, more work. I'm not sure how you ever grind this one. You have to do it sideways. Figure that one out someday. Actually, you know what? 
I'm going to uh, I'm going to use something. I have a diamond plate. I'm really impressed with. Give me a second while I grab it. This is made by uh, a friend of mine, English craftsman. Come on over here, Frank. Sold by Trend. I actually started selling them because I was really impressed with it. It's uh, it's thick enough that it'll actually stay flat. I think they guarantee it to be within a half a thou over its length. Thousand grit diamond on one side, three hundred grit on the other side, and we use it in here in uh, in making the tools that we do. We sharpen everything off of it, and it still cuts as good as the day I got it. And I've had it for six months, so I'm quite impressed. And this cutting fluid. Really, I mean, I would never have thought it made that much of a difference, but it really does. It keeps the particles suspended so it doesn't clog, lubricates it, and uh, I like it. So I'm going to use this just because that nick is fairly heavy, so I can get rid of it a lot faster. feel it bite and I've always had a diamond plate in the shop just because there's always jobs that you need some fairly coarse grinding however you want to be um, you want a little more control than what you're going to get on a bench grinder and the diamond stones I've had I remember buying the first set well, probably 30 years ago and it seems like two months later after using them they, they had nothing left on them they just didn't cut and then I found out there's something about the difference whether it's mono Oh, I can't remember the names, but anyway, there's different different types of industrial diamond. Next brand I got worked okay, but I was always suspect of it because it was so thin, I couldn't understand how they could possibly keep the tolerances for flatness that they stated. Anyway, this is what really impressed me about this particular one, and the performance has been up to snuff. So, you can see the new secondary bevel on there. It's, uh, it cuts quite aggressively, and I think that burr is gone but I'm going to go just for another second or two just to make sure and then I'll jump right over to the 1000 all right now we'll go back down here to the 1000 and then finish up with the 16 do the back and be done with it It's a small enough area that we're working on that it shouldn't take very long on the 1000. Probably doing, I probably could have gone right to the 16,000 and just applied the tertiary bevel, but I'll clean it up a little bit there. All right, and then over here to the 16, up a little bit higher. Now, I want to see a full width shadow on that stone and by that I mean I know the edge is straight if the black mark or the gray mark that's being left on the stone is the full width of the blade and it's not, oh there's a bit of a burr in the way Let me flip this over Expected this to take this long. All right, let's have a close look. All right, that looks good. Got that out of square though. Hopefully, it'll still work. Back in the tool, lock it in place. Now, as I mentioned, the problem is I can't use the skew block plane to cut this. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to reference the depth off of the one that I was able to cut. 
thumb tight should be enough. Okay. Now what I have to be able to do here, and this is the reason why I like the small one. In fact, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. In the large router plane, you can see how far away the support of the two flats are from the blade. Whereas this one, you're a quarter of an inch away. So I usually, I use this one ten times more than I use the large one. So I've got to come in here and I have to reference everything off of this inside face. So I can't allow this to tip. I also want to be careful, particularly when you're doing this in some woods, making a straight cut across there. We'll have those fibers. will have those fibers will have a tendency to roll or tear. That's one of the things I meant. To, I forgot to mention to you on the skew block plane because of the skew angle of the blade. Can you see that, Frick? Mm -hmm. It's no guarantee, but it's your best chance of getting a nice clean cut when you're cutting across the grain. So on this one, I'm going to skew the blade a little bit if I can. All of the reference is off of my right hand. And I'm skewing the cut so that hopefully we don't tear out. So Ed, if you're watching, this is a good tip. Now, just before I finish that, I'm going to come in and I'm going to uh, deepen that scribe line. There. That'll just, well, that's as far as I can go with that. So I'm going to need a chisel to finish it. this tool nice and sharp and then those fibers will work will come off nice all right works perfect now if we if we had done that sooner when we come in when we came in to set that out that would have registered that just perfectly not that we weren't able to do it the other way but this is so convenient so tip my hat to Ed appreciate the comment and I hope you guys will uh We'll do what Ed did, and if you see something that you think may be a better way or you want me to experiment with it, I'm more than happy to. I mean, this is all about trying to learn better ways of doing this. And I don't claim to know everything. I have a fair bit of experience, but I can always benefit from a few extra eyes and hands. Okay, set these tools aside, and I want to go to work cutting the groove that's going to house the bottom and uh, the sliding lid on the top. I want to tell you one thing about... Um, what we did here last time. I had the option of cutting a piece of wood and putting it down in the bottom of here to control the depth of the cut. And the only uh, and it would have saved me from having to permanently modify this, but I can make these in a, an hour, so I didn't mind changing that by taking this down so that it controls the depth of the cut to where we're only cutting in there maybe an eighth of an inch, a little bit more. Wasn't sure whether I made that clear last time. Okay, I want to make sure my hands are nice and clean. I don't want to leave any marks on this pine. Okay, because we're cutting a uh, through uh, half blinds, we can go all the way through on both pieces. So we will set this in place. This is where you really appreciate wise bench dog layout. Yeah, this is always, <laughs> it never, never works out to be what I want. So I'll put a little spacer in there. I need to have that hanging out over the edge. I want it well supported, and I don't want to leave a mark or damage this. Make sure that's it. If I'm not talking loud enough, sometimes I mumble. Make sure you guys say something so that these guys can hear. 
Okay, got to ignore grain direction because I can only cut one way with this. But if the blade is sharp enough, actually, you know what? I should have tried this before. We already set it, but I want to just make sure that it's cutting um, just the way I want. And I don't want to experiment on this piece. So this was a sample one that I had cut earlier. Let me just put that in there and double check. Okay, make sure the wedge is set tight. Now, you've got a fence on here. But it's imperative that I keep this standing plumb. I want that groove to be cut so that the side walls are perpendicular to the face. And I want to make it a full width pass. I'm not making it too heavy of a cut because just in case the grain really changes direction on me, if I take nice light passes, I'll be okay. I'm trying to hog it out in heavy cuts, although it wouldn't take me as many strokes, I run the risk of tearing something out. Okay, so this is working fine. Set that one aside go ahead and start on the real ones. Now this is the one that I already had started on so that when we laid out our dovetail we made sure they were in the right spot. You remember we went in and just did a light pass. Just want to make sure that that's still in the exact same groove it is. Now those shavings are jamming up in there and I may need to go in with a carving gouge and relieve that. I usually do. I just didn't do it on this one because this was a reject because of that knot that I exposed in the back. Just like any other plane, and maybe I should explain it, when you start, all the pressure on the front hand is pushing straight down. Pressure on the back hand is just pushing forward. Don't bear down at all because you don't want to tip it. You want to make sure you pick up a shaving as soon as the blade engages the wood. Now at this point, both hands are pushing down and forward. And then as we get toward the end of the cut, this hand let, it is not pushing down nearly as hard and this rear hand compensates by pushing down a little bit harder just to prevent that droop or drop off that would typically occur as the resistance ends when the blade exits the board. Okay Frick, I want you to come over here on the other side. No, I'll show them, you gotta make sure they get this right. <coughs> this groove this groove is going to be seen because this is where the lid is going to slide in. So we would have, we we would have, we got to make sure that this groove, the sides are perpendicular to this. So as you look, as the camera looks on, this should look. This plane should be standing plumb. Is it? Appears to be yes. It's a light touch. Before I do the next one, I'm going to fix this plane because I don't like the fact that it's shaving is jamming every time. You got five minutes. Do I? Okay. That should curl out of there. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. It's driving me nuts. Okay. Release the wedge. Sometimes you can just hit that in the back. Other times you can just do it with hand pressure. All right, I'm going to grab a gouge. And what I need to do is 
they just need to get a little relief right here. So that those shavings will clear and roll off to the side. I make no claim to carving skill. However, I had Chris Pye in my shop a few years ago and we did three, uh, three video series on sharpening and carving and I, I know what to do now I've got to practice and do it. Chris is an excellent teacher and the videos are available and because there's a royalty agreement between the two of us I can't put those ones on the website. You need those ones, you're going to have to buy them. Now I want to control it so that I don't end up running the chisel into the rest of the plane. Okay, now lots of uh, back pressure with my left hand to control this. That way I can apply a lot of pressure with my right hand, but I keep it under control. Give you some dimensions on this plane too if you want to make your own. I I have uh, some IBC blades that we sell if you want to order and make plane. We also sell the finished plane. Grab my measuring tape and I'll give you the dimensions. This is about 10 inches long by three and a half inches wide. inch and shy three-eighths thick and I do it the easy way. I start with I start with a piece that is ten by three and a half by just a little under an inch and I cut out cut out the uh, relief this area which would normally be mortise but way too much work and then I put the blade in place and I cut a wedge and with this open, in other words, this top piece is not on, when you've got that open mortise, if you want to call it that, you can go ahead and get this to fit so that when you put the wedge in, it comes tight at the same time, both front and back. In other words, it's, if it's, the wedge taper is not the same, doesn't match the taper on the open mortise, then it's either going to get tight at the bottom first or at the top. You don't want that. You want it to get tight all along that line. Once you get it right, you just go ahead and glue another piece on the top, just be careful the glue doesn't go into your mortise or else it becomes a very big pain trying to get that glue out. Glue that on, chamfer it all the way around, and voila, you've got a drawer bottom plane. So let's see if that will allow those shavings to clear better. How are we for time? Uh, we're out. We're out? Okay, well, one minute. One minute? Wrap her up. Good, I just want to, I want to put this back in and see if we get this to work better. Where's my little block of wood that I was using in there for a spacer? There. Make sure that we've got that back in the exact same spot. Looks like it is. It's a little heavier. In fact, it's too heavy. I better retract that a little bit. And that's still jamming on me. So I may have to go in there and fix the wedge. I think that's the problem now. But I'm also going to retract that. That was a little too heavy of a cut. Now, just start to see that blade. 
and I will, uh, Frick, did we do this last time, or you had the camera down there? I think so, yeah. Okay. That one's still jamming. Got to fix it. We're out of time. So, on our uh, next episode, first thing we're going to do is fix this and get it tuned up so it's working properly. We'll work on that wedge a little bit, and we'll get the rest of these cut. Okay, we'll see you back here for episode number whatever. <laughs>